The horizon looks almost unreal that afternoon, a straight silver line where heat and light merge into one. The destroyer USS Jason Dunham, an Arleigh Burke-class warship, cuts through the water with calm precision, its hull gleaming under the sun, engines humming at a steady rhythm. The smell of salt and metal hangs in the air. Crewmen move along the deck in the kind of quiet routine that only long deployments teach, until the stillness begins to change. Far ahead, in the shimmer of the sky, two dark specks appear. At first they could be seabirds, nothing more. Then the shapes sharpen. Wings, fuselage, the hard glint of sunlight off canopies. Two F-16s, Venezuelan, flying low and fast, hugging the waves as if trying to hide in their reflection. The rumble reaches the ship a few seconds later, a deep, rolling vibration that rattles loose fittings and turns every head on deck. The jets roar past in a single, violent burst, barely a hundred feet above the bow, leaving behind streaks of heat and the smell of burned fuel. To the sailors who witness it, the scene feels like a challenge, loud, reckless, and deliberate. Inside the Combat Information Center, though, no one flinches. The SPY-1 radar had tracked those aircraft long before the lookout even spotted them. Altitude, bearing, airspeed, all were displayed clearly on the glowing panels that cover the walls. For the operators, this isn't surprise, it's confirmation. What looks like bravado from the outside is, in truth, free data handed over on a silver platter. Every radar ping, every radio transmission, every change in engine output is being logged in real time. What Venezuela calls a show of defiance, the Navy sees as a live intelligence harvest. To understand why, you have to see the imbalance built into this encounter. The two machines in the sky and the warship below belong to entirely different centuries of design and warfare. The Venezuelan F-16s are survivors from the early 1980s. Aircraft bought under Washington's old Peace Delta program when Caracas wanted to modernize its air force. Back then, they were state-of-the-art, supersonic, agile, equipped with radars that impressed their neighbors. Four decades later, they are relics held together by scavenged parts and improvised maintenance. U.S. sanctions cut off the supply chain years ago, and most of the fleet sits grounded, stripped for components. Analysts believe only a handful, maybe three or four, can still fly, and even those operate on borrowed time. Their avionics are outdated, their radars limited, their weapons barely functional. What remains is pride, not capability. The destroyer beneath them represents the opposite extreme, and Arleigh Burke is more than a ship. It is a mobile combat ecosystem. 500 feet of reinforced steel, divided into armored compartments, so it can take damage and keep fighting. Deep inside its core lies the Aegis Combat System, a digital brain linking every radar, missile, and communication channel into a single, real-time network. The ship's S by one array scans the sky in a constant 360-degree sweep, tracking more than 100 contacts at once. Newer versions carry the SPY-6 radar, even more sensitive, capable of detecting stealthier threats at longer ranges. In simple terms, if you are flying toward a Burke, the ship saw you long before you saw it. And that radar picture is only the first layer. Beneath the deck sit more than 90 vertical launch cells, loaded with a tailored mix of weapons. Long-range standard missiles for intercepting aircraft, evolved sea sparrows for medium-range defense, tomahawks for land attack, and anti-submarine rockets for threats below the surface. Together, they form a dome of protection measured not in miles, but in layers of time. Engage far, engage closer, engage again if anything survives. And if a target somehow breaks through all that, the final curtain drops fast, the Sea Whiz Gatling gun that spits out 75 rounds of tungsten per second, drawing a wall of fire across the sky. That is the reality hiding beneath the noise of two old fighters skimming the waves. For the Venezuelan pilots, the mission is theater, proof for television audiences that their country can still stand up to the United States. For the sailors on the destroyer, it is little more than background footage for a training manual. Every pulse from the F-16's aging radar, every trace of heat from their engines, and every fragment of radio chatter is being captured and cataloged. Within hours, analysts in Washington will be studying the data, radar cross-sections, engine signatures, and electronic fingerprints that intelligence agencies usually spend months trying to obtain. Only a few days earlier, a U.S. airstrike had destroyed a Venezuelan-linked speedboat in the Southern Caribbean, killing 11 suspected cartel members. 
Washington called it a counter-narcotics operation. Caracas called it an act of aggression. President Maduro needed a response the public could see. Something quick, visual, and patriotic. A flyby over an American warship fit perfectly. Dangerous enough to look bold, safe enough to avoid escalation. It was meant to send a message. Instead, it exposed exactly how far behind Venezuela's Air Force has fallen. Modern warfare isn't about who fires first anymore. It's about who remains unseen the longest. And on that day, under that blinding Caribbean sun, the imbalance could not have been clearer. Two aging jets flying on borrowed parts against a destroyer that could erase them from the sky before they ever knew they were targeted. The ocean looked peaceful, but every radar pulse told a different story. A story of one nation performing for pride, and another quietly recording every second of it. To truly understand why Venezuela's F-16s never stood a chance against a modern U.S. destroyer, you have to look beyond the footage and the noise of that September afternoon. The imbalance wasn't just in firepower, it was in time itself. One side belonged to the past, the other to a future that had already arrived. Modern naval warfare is no longer about the clash of metal, but about who sees, who connects, and who decides first. And on that day, every advantage belonged to the ship. Detection is where every battle begins now. The ocean may seem empty, but in reality, it is a living grid of sensors, satellites, and data streams. The destroyer USS Jason Dunham didn't just float on the sea. It lived inside a network that stretched across the hemisphere. Its SPY-1 radar pulsed through the humid Caribbean air, mapping everything that moved for hundreds of miles in every direction. On glowing screens inside the Combat Information Center, those radar reflections turned into patterns, small points of light marking jets, clouds, and waves. Long before the Venezuelan pilots even approached, the ship already knew their speed, altitude, and vector. Every sweep of the radar tightened the picture until the jets existed not as distant shapes, but as coordinates. The pilots might have believed they were running low, invisible against the water, but the destroyer saw the heat rising from their engines, the frequency of their radar pulses, even the faint change in their flight rhythm as they turned on afterburners for the cameras. For the ship, they were not threats, they were data in motion. The Venezuelan F-16s, built in the early 1980s, still carried analog hearts. Their radars were narrow and limited, their data links primitive, their computers designed for a world before the internet existed. Every time their system switched on, they announced their presence to a hundred listening ears. The destroyer's electronic warfare suite captured those emissions instantly, logging them for analysis, comparing them to decades of archived signals. It was the modern equivalent of a chess player studying his opponent's every move before the game even began. The pilots couldn't know that, far above them, American satellites were also watching, and that their flight path had already been transmitted across the network linking ships, aircraft, and command centers. The duel they imagined was never equal. It had been mapped long before they crossed the horizon. But detection alone is only the first step. The real difference lies in what follows. A destroyer like the Jason Dunham is built around the concept of layered defense, a moving fortress that can protect itself from threats across every domain. Each system is designed to buy time, to extend the life of the ship by seconds that mean survival. If a hostile aircraft or missile appears far beyond the horizon, Long-range interceptors like the SM-2 or SM-6 are launched. They rise vertically from their cells, guided by the Aegis combat system, and satellites feeding them mid-course updates, hunting targets that the human eye could never see. Closer in, the ship shifts to its medium-range defenses, the evolved Sea Sparrow missiles, fast, agile weapons designed to catch threats maneuvering hard and low. And should anything survive that, the last line waits with mechanical patience, the 20mm Sea Whiz Gatling gun, its six barrels spinning at 75 rounds per second, spitting a wall of tungsten that no aircraft could cross alive. Many Burks now mount additional Sea Ram pods as well, small autonomous launchers that expand that protective bubble even further. Each layer overlaps the next, and every second of flight toward the ship means entering deeper into a space where survival becomes almost mathematically impossible. An aircraft, no matter how brave its pilot, can only act once. A destroyer can fight for hours, for days, absorbing damage and returning fire. Its hull is built not for beauty, but for endurance. Steel frames reinforced with Kevlar, divided into compartments that can be sealed in seconds. Fire suppression systems flood damage sections. Backup generators reroute power. If the ship is hit, it fights through the pain. If an aircraft is hit, it simply ceases to exist. 
That is the difference between depth and fragility, between systems designed for one strike and those built to survive a campaign. It is not about courage or willpower. It is about design philosophy, about which side learned to endure longer than the other could act. The most important truth, though, is that a destroyer never fights alone. It is not a single ship adrift in an ocean. It is a node in a vast machine, linked to cruisers, submarines, early warning aircraft, and command centers thousands of miles away. The Jason Dunham's radar picture isn't its own. It belongs to a collective intelligence that sees everything above and below the surface. Every radar pulse, every sonar ping, every infrared scan is shared in real time. For the Venezuelan pilots, flying their two aging jets across the water must have felt like courage. For the Navy officers watching from their screens, it was like watching two small shapes move inside a glass dome that they themselves controlled. When the F-16s roared over the ship that afternoon, state television in Caracas called it an act of defiance. The footage looped on repeat, two silver jets flashing against the sky, their afterburners blazing as they passed over the gray shape of the destroyer. Anchors spoke of sovereignty, of courage, of sending a message to Washington. Crowds cheered. For a few hours, the story was one of national pride. But on the other side of the ocean, in a dark operations room filled with monitors and quiet voices, that same footage played for a different reason. Analysts paused the frames, measured the exhaust signatures, calculated radar cross-sections, compared engine harmonics to archived data. Within hours, they had built a detailed picture of Venezuela's Air Force capabilities. What still worked, what didn't, what had been repaired too many times. What one country celebrated as a victory of will, the other treated as a free intelligence sweep. The United States didn't respond with outrage. It didn't have to. Within days, 10 F-35 Lightning II fighters arrived in Puerto Rico, joining the network that already covered the region. These stealth aircraft, invisible to outdated radars, expanded the surveillance reach even further. At least seven U.S. warships continued to patrol the Caribbean, their radars and drones weaving a silent web of control. No press releases were needed. The response was presence. The message was clear. The game Venezuela had chosen to play was one where every move was already anticipated. In the end, that flyby changed nothing in the balance of power. It didn't threaten the destroyer. It didn't shake American resolve. What it did was reveal the gap between symbolism and capability. On one side were relic fighters trying to look dangerous for a camera. On the other stood a warship that didn't even blink, connected to a fleet that could erase those aircraft from the sky long before their pilots realized they had been targeted. The danger was never that Venezuela might damage a U.S. ship. The real danger was that a single misinterpreted maneuver, a radar lock misread, or a pilot too eager to prove a point could start something that no one could stop. As evening fell over the Caribbean, the sea returned to its quiet rhythm. The destroyer's wake stretched out like a silver scar under the fading light. The F-16s, low on fuel, turned back toward their base, their cameras filled with the footage that would soon run on every national channel. For their crews, the mission was over. For the sailors aboard the Jason Dunham, it was just another entry in the logbook, a brief flare of movement in an otherwise routine day. The radar dishes kept turning, the Aegis system kept scanning, and the calm professionalism of the ship never broke. Somewhere out there, far above the dark water, invisible satellites continued to watch, linking everything together in silence. That is what modern power looks like. It doesn't raise its voice. It doesn't need to. It simply observes, records, and remains ready. One side plays for spectacle, the other for certainty. One side flies close to the surface, burning fuel for the sake of pride. The other sails steadily forward, patient and unshaken, its strength measured not in noise but in awareness. And in that quiet balance, the truth of modern warfare is revealed. The louder the performance, the deeper the weakness. The ocean keeps its secrets, but the machines that guard it never sleep. The F-16s disappeared into the dusk that night, their roar fading into memory, while the destroyer continued its course through the calm, endless water a moving fortress in a world where silence is the ultimate weapon.